I'm Wade Patterson. I'm the Executive Director at Sawmill Community Land Trust. I had a former career in the arts, so this is like a great synergy for me to be back talking about arts uh, and planning for my new career. So cities all over the country right now are looking for ways to create the favorable conditions to drive things like innovation, change, and creative solutions to vexing problems, really to establish a 21st century city. And many cities are looking to theorists, like economist Richard Florida, who's already been cited, uh, and his concept of the creative class. And a lot of cities are even, including Albuquerque, developing policies around these concepts in order to reap the benefits of what supposedly the creative class is going to bring to us. So, for those of you who don't know what the creative class is, according to Florida, this is a group of people, it's like an emergent demographic of uh, people who work in knowledge industries, technology, very technologically sophisticated, they're highly educated, and they're highly mobile. And the assertion here is that if you can create the favorable conditions to attract these people to your city, they're gonna help you solve the problems and make your city the 21st century city. There's something about this that just doesn't feel quite right to me. And I was thinking about it, and I think what struck me is that it feels a little bit like the gentrification conversation. In gentrification, we say, oh, this community here has been struggling with endemic poverty, they've uh, disinvestment. They just don't have the right people. If we can bring the right people in who will invest in these places and improve them, then you know we'll be on the right track. But what happens is we just displace the people who already live there. We haven't improved their quality of life, and now we just move the problem to another part of the city. So I fear that by structuring our policy around these kinds of theories that we're missing the boat. We're missing the genius oops, that is in our own community. And so to illustrate that, I want to tell the story of Sawmill Community Land Trust, which is a really exciting grassroots story about a community that lives next to what you see on the top. That is the Ponderosa Products Press Board Factory uh, doing some illegal burning uh, in the 90s of materials that they weren't supposed to burn. With leftovers and soaked in creosote and other chemicals. And people would wake up to having this stuff all over their house, their car, if their windows were open, it was on them. And so they started to organize around this action. What you see on the bottom of the screen is our sort of flagship uh, affordable housing multifamily complex, the Sawmill Laws. So, Sawmill Community Land Trust is built on 34 acres of former brownfield site, former industrial sawmill related industries, including the press board factory. And by the way, that picture was taken by a local resident who managed, knew someone who worked at Hotel Albuquerque, got on top of the hotel at dawn and took that picture to document and prove to the city that this was actually happening. So on the top you see what it used to look like. On the bottom you see a picture that was taken last summer uh, and what we've managed to accomplish since about 2000 when we started the, the build out to reinvent and reimagine this urban space that had been industrial but now as the city has grown has other potentials. We have stitched it together with a pre-existing neighborhood to the west and what you're looking at here are 93 single family homes, three multifamily complexes, all affordable housing. Uh, a park, a plaza, an upcoming community garden, and a forthcoming economic development phase that will bring jobs and commercial activity to the area. So how did this happen? Well, it was these folks. And I don't think Richard Florida thinks they belong to the creative class, but I'll tell you, there's some very creative thinking people. <laughs> and they innovated, and they struggled, and one of the most genius things that they did is that initially this was an environmental justice action. They had a really unpleasant neighbor, a lot of vacant and polluted industrial land and a, an irresponsible industrial neighbor. And they realized after they convinced the city to acquire this land and remediate it, well, what's gonna happen to this land? What's gonna be our neighbor? And they realized that this location, being in the urban core, was with its access to transit, to jobs, to other amenities, could really provide a springboard by providing opportunities through affordable housing for emerging families, households, to really start to move up the ladder into to middle class. And so they had lots and lots of meetings, and they looked at lots and lots of models, and they debated, and they, they thought creatively, and they just threw out any ideas they could, and they came up with the community land trust model. There's only about 200 community land trusts around the country, and uh, Sawmill Community Land Trust is the largest contiguous land trust. We're in one of the top, gee, I say all this, but I'm new on board, so it's not like I did it. 
but uh, it's really a, a leader in the country for this innovative model for creating permanently affordable housing. Here's my 30 second explanation. The nonprofit organization owns all of the land in trust. If you come onto the land trust to buy a home, and this is mainly a mechanism for home ownership, although we also have rental, you buy just the house. You don't buy the land too. That is the main way that we leverage the affordability. We hold the land in trust. You have a land lease for the use of your yard, and it's just like any other neighborhood in the city. I want to point out a few things about the way that this is all built out and the kind of thought and insistence that the local community had about how this should be built. It has a lot of what we might think of as new urbanist principles, you know, front porches, a lot of windows that look out from common areas inside the house onto the street. The houses engage well with one another. It's made of durable materials. We have metal roofs and stucco uh, siding. We've got uh, low E windows, uh, two by six construction, um, Energy Star appliances. It has to be affordable to operate and to purchase. And one of the other things that I think was really brilliant about the local community was recognizing the importance that a neighborhood is not just houses. It has to have public space. We have senior housing that is integrated right next to the park, so they're not pushed off to the side. They're part of the community. And public space. This is an award-winning plaza that was one of the first spaces designed. It's also a stormwater detention site, so it does double duty. And it's heavily used. Birthday parties, Easter egg hunt, Halloween, you name it. And because it's important to build social capital, you have to have spaces for people to gather, and you also have to have programming to bring people out and encourage them to be together. And that's the extent of my, my presentation. But what I want to say, what my summary is really about this creative class, you know, don't get too, too excited about it. I think what we really need to do is recognize the genius that is in our community already and create the kind of mechanisms that can be engaged the community and bring these innovative ideas to the surface because you never know what corner of our neighborhoods the genius is living in. Thank you.